So today we're in Luke chapter 19, verse 28 to 44. And the title of our message is called Missing the Moment. Today is Palm Sunday when we remember the beginning of the most significant week in history. As we have been focusing on the book of Genesis for a while, I thought it would be good to focus this Sunday on what Jesus did in the Gospels so we can prepare our hearts for this Easter season, which is the most important time of year for Christians, even more significant than Christmas. Have you ever been so concerned about something that you missed the heart of an important moment? I remember our wedding day, Megan and I were planning a wedding. More credit goes to Megan for the planning of this wedding. It was an amazing work she did. And it was choreographed. We had a photographer, we had a videographer ready to go. The catch was that it was June 2005, and it was a huge flood in Calgary. It was the wettest day in recorded history in Alberta. <laughs> and many people could not make it to the wedding. We had a video guy who texted us in, or maybe he called back in 2005, <laughs> and he said, you know what, my basement's flooding. I'm not going to make it. And so this amazing wedding uh, was suffering from some consequences of the weather. And it wasn't going quite the way we wanted in the sense of making a video and photographs and all the rest being reined in. The temptation was there to miss this amazing moment by thinking about all these details, focusing on the image and the pictures rather than the actual moment. It was frustrating. It rained a lot. And we did lose that video. We did lose uh, some of the pictures we had in mind. But thankfully, the Lord was with us. And he really challenged us, just enjoy this moment. You may not have anything to really remember it by as much as you want, but this is the moment of your wedding. Enjoy it, Colin and Megan. And so we looked for the positives. Yes, it was wet. But the golf course where we had the reception was completely ours. There were no golfers around. So that was a positive. And we could enjoy being with our family and friends and being with each other on that special day. Have you ever missed the heart of God in a situation? Today we'll see how an entire city of people were present and even participating in a great event. But they completely missed the heart of God in the most significant moment in history. Now, before we get into our main passage, I want us to just zoom out for a moment and have a look at what was happening leading up to the cross and the resurrection. The four Gospels are eyewitness accounts of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have about 30 chapters devoted to this special, momentous event or the series of events that happened that one week building up to Psalm uh, from Palm Sunday going to Resurrection Sunday. So just to recount a few of those highlights. Sunday, we'll talk about that, Palm Sunday. But then on Monday, Jesus cleansed the temple of all the corrupt money changers who were exploiting religion and stopping the people from knowing and worshiping God. He cursed the fig tree that had leaves but no fruit. It was a symbol of Israel and their unfruitfulness, especially the religious leaders. And the tree withered up and died that same day. On Tuesday, Jesus taught for hours in public in Jerusalem. He was tested. He was tried questions that were tricky, ways to trip him up. But Jesus answered every test flawlessly, showing his wisdom, showing his authority. And during that week, each household was examining Passover lambs to be worthy in their home. And Jesus was out in public being examined and proving himself spotless and perfect. He passed every single test. He really was the Lamb of God. And Jesus gave a powerful sermon on the last days, Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. 
And Judas went out and made a deal with the corrupt leaders to hand him over at an appointed time. And then Wednesday, we believe, was a day of rest. Not much happened. And then on Thursday, the action took off again. Jesus gathered his close disciples to celebrate Passover with him. He taught them about his sacrifice. And he gave us the new covenant. He showed us how to take uh, those elements and remember him at the Lord's Supper. What he was about to do at the cross the next day. He taught the disciples about a new relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit. He taught them about abiding in Christ. And he, pl- and he prayed the most beautiful prayer, John 17, about the future of the church. And he prayed for us. And then he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and resolved in prayer, not my will, but your will be done. And he sweat great drops of blood as the stress of bearing our sin began to fall upon him. He was betrayed by Judas. He was taken by the guards. He was beaten and then placed in a dungeon overnight. Then on Friday, early in the morning, he was tried multiple times by the high priests and by Pilate, and by Herod. He was treated brutally. He was scourged, whipped with a cat of nine tails. He was mocked. He was forced to carry his own beam. And by the point that he got to carrying the beam, he was already too physically wounded and weak to be able to do so. And then Jesus was crucified at the hill that looked like a skull, looked like a skull, it was called the place of the skull. It was called Calvary. He was crucified like a dirty criminal, even though he was not. He was crucified among thieves. He hung on the cross in our place, taking the judgment for our sins. The wrath of God was poured out upon him. Three hours later, as Jesus hung on the cross, a mysterious deep darkness covered the land. Three more hours later, Jesus gave up his spirit. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, showing that we are no longer separated from God. The earth quaked, large rocks were split, nature itself was shaken by the death of the Creator, by the death of the Son of God. And before sundown, Jesus was buried in a rich Pharisee's tomb, a man named Joseph a man who believed. Now the Sabbath was quiet. Mary and the disciples and those who loved Jesus were mourning. They were thinking of all their dashed hopes for the kingdom. And it was a sad time missing their Lord, believing it was all over. But then came Sunday when another earthquake took place and the tomb was miraculously opened. And eyewitnesses saw Jesus alive and resurrected in his glorified body, proving that Jesus had washed away our sins. This really was an incredible week. And I encourage you this week to devote some of the time that you plan to spend with the Lord, reading through some of those events in the latter parts of the four Gospels. May we never get used to what Jesus did for us. May we soak in this moment. May we not miss this moment. May we appreciate our Lord in this Easter season and worship him no matter what we are going through in the ups and downs of 2021. On Friday, we'll remember the cross and on Sunday, we'll remember the resurrection. So today, let's start off the week with Palm Sunday in Luke chapter 19. Now, it is almost Passover in Israel. Passover was the annual feast when the Jews remembered the exodus from Egypt and God's miraculous salvation that he provided through the blood of the Passover lamb. Picture in your mind thousands of people coming to Jerusalem, making their way to the city, hundreds of thousands for the feast, of Passover. And also, Jesus is coming from the east side, from the Dead Sea, Jericho region, toward Jerusalem. 
The city is surging with crowds, but Jesus has a plan. Let's read from Luke chapter 19, verse 28. It says, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. And so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And he said to, or they said, the Lord has need of him. <laughs> That would be an awkward moment, wouldn't it? You're one of the disciples. Jesus says, go to this street. There's a cult going to be there. Just go and start loosing it. And if they ask you, just tell them, I'm asking. So you walk up to this stranger's house. He's probably out there in the yard, enjoying the morning, doing some yard work. And you go up to the fence, and there's the donkey, and it's cult, it's baby. And you just reach over the fence and start loosing the ropes. And the guy stops what he's doing, looks at you and says, who are you? What are you doing? I feel a little nervous in that moment. <laughs> but they did just what Jesus said, and it went perfectly smooth. The guy said, oh, the Lord needs him, or the two donkeys? Great, take them. Praise God. <laughs> God is providing. Now, for three years, there has been a buildup to this moment. Jesus has never been into large crowds. This whole time, <clears throat> Jesus has done his best to minimize the idea of a large crowd. Now, multitudes followed him because of his healings and because of his incredible teachings and because of his love. So the crowds grew large and Jesus often withdrew we read how he cared deeply about individuals and how he usually ministered to people in quieter, quieter settings, out of the spotlight. Some examples would be the blind man who was healed and then accused by the Pharisees, or Jairus' daughter, or Peter's mother-in-law, or Nicodemus, the curious Pharisee, or of course the disciples. Jesus often met with these people in quiet settings. He was not into fame and fortune. He was not interested in publicity or being a celebrity. When he healed people, Jesus even said to them often, do not tell anyone what I've done for you. <laughs> because he knew that they would be unable to hold it in. And the more that they said about it, the more the fanfare would grow and around his healings and his miracles. And therefore, the large crowds would grow and and could easily drown out his message and, the, and dilute the training he was giving to his disciples that was so important. At one time, Jesus fed 5,000 in Galilee in John chapter 6, and it says that he perceived that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king. And so he departed again to the mountain alone. Isn't that interesting? Our Lord, for three years, knew that his hour had not yet come. His hour to draw a crowd had not yet come. His hour to be hailed as king had not yet come. Until this day, there is one exception, and that is today, as Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, knowing that finally his hour has indeed arrived and that he will be revealed as Messiah to the nation of Israel. So the scene begins with Jesus approaching Jerusalem from the east, from the Mount of Olives. Now, don't think that the mountain was like the Rocky Mountain or like Banff or Mount Yumnusco or something like that. The Mount of Olives was a large hill 
with pathways and villages and a garden there in Gethsemane. And so Jesus is still outside the city, but he's moving in that direction with his disciples. We just read verse 30 to 34. And at Palm Sunday, we see that there is a donkey involved. <laughs> and this donkey was definitely a key part of the story. And there were really three reasons why there was going to be a donkey involved. The three reasons can be put with the letters P. Poverty, prophecy, and peace. Poverty. You see, Jesus always identified with the common people. The mighty and the rich may have owned horses, while the lowly and the poor owned donkeys. Second P is prophecy. In Matthew 21, it explains that this was a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which foretold that the Messiah would come to be a king, but would also be revealed riding a donkey because of his humility. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, in Zechariah. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and lowly, having salvation, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Messiah will ride a young, unridden donkey in that day. And Jesus does exactly this. He rode a colt that was unbroken and had never been ridden before. Now, if you want to grab a kid's attention, bring them a baby animal. Or just load up a video on your phone of some cute baby animals. You see, Jesus always had time for the humble and for the lowly and for the children. He encouraged childlike faith. And Matthew's gospel says they borrowed both the mother donkey and the colt. Jesus did not separate the colt from its mother. Jesus' care and concern was to show tenderness, to show care for the individual, even the young donkey and its mother. And don't miss this. The colt is unridden. It is unbroken. It has never experienced a rider before. But it willingly submitted to Jesus and served him. And it was used, this donkey, by the Lord to bring glory to Jesus. So the donkey there is poverty, prophecy, but also the third reason is peace. Peace. How often have you heard of a king being coronated on a donkey? We're a little bit familiar with the image of ancient kings. And we would expect a king to be riding a horse, a stallion, or a steed. Surely a king needs to impress. Jesus should at least have a camel or something tall, right? A colt was small, not much bigger than a great Dane. <laughs> at this time in history, though, everybody knew a military ruler would ride a horse, but a peacemaker king will ride a donkey. King Solomon was an example of this in Israel's history. David was a man of war, but Solomon was to be a king of peace. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 38, Israel's greatest king in the entire Old Testament was coronated as the king of the Jews while riding a mule into Jerusalem. Interesting, hey? Jesus was not just any king. He was the Messiah. He was the long-awaited savior of Israel. But he was not a violent revolutionary. Jesus was saying, I'm your king, but I come on a donkey. I come in peace. See, he came not to be a political hero, but a spiritual savior. Not to defeat armies, but to defeat sin. Not to kill, but to die. And no one who looked on that day fully understood what God was up to. Imagine the Roman reaction. 10,000 soldiers in town for the Passover. One to two million Jews swelling the city, and now they begin shouting, the king is coming! And the soldiers, they know this is a problem for them. This could be an uproar, an uprising. This could be the end of, of 
peace as they have been controlling it, so to speak, in Jerusalem. And so they cannot see this king. So they push the crowds aside. They're ready to fight this king. But as they open up the crowds, they see a humble, gentle man riding a baby donkey (laughs) coming in peace. Jesus chose the donkey to speak of poverty, prophecy, and his mission of peace. Now make no mistake about it. Jesus was announcing himself to the Jews as their long-awaited Savior and King and Messiah. This was his hour. It is now time. God is setting the stage for Jesus to die at Passover in a few days. Jesus is going to be the Passover lamb to fulfill that great picture of an innocent lamb dying to save those who will trust in his blood. And so now God is realizing and moving in his time to draw a big crowd. And briefly, Jesus allows the spotlight of God announcing him as Messiah to come upon him. Look at Luke 19, verse 35. Then they brought to him, or him, the cult, to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the cult, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. So a crowd begins to gather. Who are this crowd? Who are they? Well, they are Passover pilgrims, the common Jewish people of the day. Many of them had eaten those loaves and the fish. They had experienced Jesus' miracles. They had followed him around for three exciting years. They had watched in wonder as he rebuked those wicked Pharisees. And now they can see him coming and a crowd starting to gather around him and they all join in. They don't have a red carpet, so they make one with their clothes. They take off their jacket and put it down for the donkey to ride on. Would you do that with your Levi jacket today? (laughs) And they don't have a red carpet, so they also grab palm branches, the other three Gospels add. And they wave them around and they make a royal uh, makeshift carpet with them. Now, why palm branches? Was there something significant there? Actually, there was. We call it Palm Sunday because of how they took the palm branches. And the palm tree, or the palm branch, was a symbol of peace in many ancient cultures. So Jesus accepted this because he was a king of peace. Now in the Old Testament, there was also this picture of the coming millennial kingdom of the Messiah's reign on earth for a thousand years. And in that picture, it talks about how they will be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, how they'll be grabbing these palm branches and making booths annually. And so they are getting excited thinking that the kingdom is coming right now. In the minds of the crowds, the palm branch is not just peace, but it's peace by military victory over the Romans. And by waving these branches, they are saying, we want a revolution. We want to bring this destruction on the Romans now. They wanted to fight off the legions that were around Jerusalem. The crowds were short-sighted. They didn't get that the real enemy that Jesus came to deal with was sin in our hearts. I'm sure this crowd was looking at Jesus on the donkey, thinking, why is he on a donkey? Something's wrong here. Surely someone's going to bring him a horse at any minute, and he's going to jump on, and we're going to take up arms. It even says in Luke 19, if you go back to verse 11, that they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. They were so ready, but they were wrong. The palms revealed their mistaken hopes of a physical uprising and that they missed the point that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to die for sin. Look at Luke 19, verse 37. And 38, it says, Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. 
They praise Jesus for his miracles. That's good. But their hope is still for an uprising. Look at verse 38. They said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And here they're quoting from Psalm 118 that we read at the beginning of the service today. The other gospels say they also read another verse or, or shouted it and sang it from another verse from Psalm 118. Hosanna, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, they believe this was a messianic moment, but not to die for sin, to defeat the Romans. They were mistaken. And although they're getting excited, they're missing the point. Jesus here is submitted to the Father, and he has a mission to save the world in this moment. To save the world in this week, this holy week. And he will do this as the Lamb of God laying down his life at the cross and then rising again. Luke goes on in verse 39, and it says, Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. The Pharisees there around the Temple Mount as Jesus is coming toward Jerusalem and coming down the Mount of Olives, they start trying to rebuke Jesus and tell him off. And they say, Jesus, stop it. What you are doing, tell these people to be quiet. But you know what? You cannot stop what God is doing. Wouldn't it be amazing, by the way, if the crowds had just calmed themselves down at this moment and held a moment's silence? That would have been crazy. I wonder what it would have sounded like to hear Jerusalem full of, of rocks everywhere, singing out as Jesus said. Now that would be a rock concert <laughs> that I would love to be at. Now you can see in this day that Jesus, his life is very significant, and at this moment, his prophecy is being fulfilled from Zechariah chapter 9, and even more clearly from Daniel chapter 9. Now, last year we did a full study on this, and it's in the audio message archive on our website. Look for Palm Sunday 2020. Simply put, God revealed to the prophet Daniel that this was a very special day, and he gave even to the calendar prediction the day of Palm Sunday. Daniel gave this prophecy 600 years before Palm Sunday, but when you study Daniel 9, the 70 weeks, you come to April 6, 32 AD, the very day that Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. They should have known that this was their day. And so Jesus said, if you shut these people up, the rocks are going to cry out because God is in control. God's working. You cannot stop what God is doing. The, the Messiah is here. The long-awaited day of his coming to Jerusalem is now. God is always in control, and he's worthy of nothing less than our praise. God is using this national fervor, which is rising here on Palm Sunday, to begin the domino effect of events that will lead to Jesus' crucifixion a week from now. Now look at verse 41. It says, As he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the day that Daniel had said, if they had only taken heed to the word of God, they would have known. And Jesus says, you would, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. Now, why do Christians call Palm Sunday Jesus' triumphal entry? I suppose because he was finally receiving praise as Messiah. There's some triumph in that. He's fulfilling many prophecies. There's great triumph in that. Maybe it's because our Bibles have the heading above this passage, the triumphal entry. 
Now, those headings are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're added for our benefit later. And you know what? I suppose if we were in the crowd that day, we would call it the triumphal entry. We would think this is a moment of triumph. We can all identify, even this morning, how being at an event in person is very different from being distant from it, from reading about it later, or as you are today, watching through a screen. Being in the flesh, being there, is radically different than watching online. (laughs) And the extra distance impacts the experience. So for us, we look at this and we're wondering where the triumph is. For them, I'm sure it was just such an emotional moment they were getting carried away. Singing, joy, scripture being said, Hosanna, save us now. And after thousands of years, the Messiah is finally here. Jesus is finally stepping into the spotlight. Yes, but the people were missing something. Look again at 41. As Jesus drew near the city, he saw it and he wept over it. The word means inconsolable weeping or wailing. His whole body is shaking with tears. He's not basking in victory. Not yet. He's bawling his eyes out. He's not shouting for joy. He's shedding tears. It might be better to call Palm Sunday Jesus' tearful entry, not his triumphal entry. Now, in Revelation chapter 19, it describes Jesus' second coming to earth after the great tribulation period that is ahead in the future. Now, that will really be Jesus' triumphal entry. Revelation 19, 11 to 16, I'll just quote one or two things. John says, He saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, And in righteousness he judges and makes war. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike his enemies. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. That's the day the Antichrist and the false prophet and all those wicked armies gathered will be destroyed. And he will be known as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That will be his triumphal entry. I'm willing to change the heading in my Bible that is not inspired Revelation 19 is his triumphal entry. This is his tearful entry. By the way, that second coming, when Jesus brings that great victory over the Antichrist, Zechariah chapter 12, you can read more about it. It even tells us where Jesus will set his feet on earth at his second coming. And shockingly, it is on the Mount of Olives. It is right in the same place where he is today weeping. Zechariah chapter 12. So back to Jesus' tears as he is there. This is the Mount of Olives behind me. You can see, taking this picture from Jerusalem, Jesus would have wound down on this donkey down the hill. And as he gets to the top of this, coming toward the holy city, Jerusalem, he is weeping. Why is Jesus weeping? Because at his first coming here on Palm Sunday, they have missed it. They've missed the moment. They've missed God's word. Look at verse 42. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. They will surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus' entry to Jerusalem ought to have been a day that they were ready for. The city as a whole should have anticipated the coming of the Messiah and known that he must suffer and die for sins just as it was written in Isaiah 53 and many other passages. But they do not know the scriptures. Jesus sees that they are spiritually blind. They're partially right. He is the king. He is the Messiah. But Jesus will not get up on a horse right now and lead a battle at this time. 
That's coming one day, but not today. They're demanding that he ride the horse and fight. Jesus knows that this same crowd is about to turn on him. And these people will immediately reject him for what he's going to do. In only a few days' time, they'll be yelling at the top of their lungs. Instead of, Hosanna, save us now, they're going to be singing and, and shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We will not have this man rule over us. Jesus wept for the lost. He wailed for them. He looks into the future of Jerusalem and sees that in the near, in that generation, there will be destruction that will come upon the Jews. Jesus sees that Israel at large will reject him as their Messiah when he died and he rose again for sin. Just like Jesus said, the city will soon be besieged, surrounded and closed in. And Jerusalem was indeed destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Less than 40 years after this day, General Titus will lead a slaughter of the city. The decisive event in the Jewish-Roman War, 143-day siege, roughly 660,000 Jews killed immediately, 1.7 million killed in the war. Jerusalem will be leveled, just as Jesus said. And the Jews will not call the promised land home again for another 1,900 years until May 1948. So Jesus wept over this city because he wept over the lost. Because he knew that their palm branches and their songs were in vain because they were spiritually blind. They wanted physical salvation. They didn't want a spiritual salvation. They wanted a temporary fix for their immediate problems. We can fall into this trap. Jesus, help me with this issue now. Save now. They didn't realize that Jesus was doing a much deeper work to free them from their sin. They rejected the saving grace that Jesus came to give them, to give to mankind. And they will continue in their pride and they will be destroyed. Now, don't misunderstand. Although Jesus is weeping, he was victorious. He knew that the next weekend he would successfully defeat the devil and sin and death and the grave. He knew that he would save us at the cross. Hebrews even tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So there was joy in, in Jesus that motivated him to go through that pain on the cross. That joy, by the way, that motivated him was you and was me. It's true that if you or I were the only ones who had sinned in this entire history of the planet, Jesus would have gone to the cross just for you. The joy set before him. He endured the cross. Despising the shame, he suffered so much to save us, and he knew he would bring victory and bring freedom to our lives. So he, there was joy but he was weeping in this moment because he knew that many would needlessly reject him, would needlessly be slaughtered and die and suffer because they missed the word of God. They did not have hearts open to the spiritual salvation. They just wanted a temporary fix. And that's not what Jesus came to give them. As we close our sermon today, I find it kind of ironic and funny that the only one who is looking on to this moment and is fully submitted to Jesus at this time is the donkey. <laughs> Whatever you want, Jesus, I'll just go on with what you say and do what you want. And actually, we can learn a lot from that donkey, can't we? Jesus has also found us. He has also loosed us. And now we're learning to submit to him and let him use us for his glory. Also, the disciples are present, and they will understand later after the resurrection. They did not have hard hearts, and God helps the humble to understand him. Those who seek him will find him. But sadly, most that day were spiritually blind. They had a hard heart, and they didn't receive what Jesus really came to do. So here's the conclusion of our service today and the question that I have for you. Are you missing the moment? 
Have you recognized who Jesus really is and what he's done for you? You can call out to Jesus today. No one else can save you from your sin. Jesus alone is the Messiah and is the Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you haven't received Christ as your Savior, in a moment we will pray together. And I encourage you to open your heart and to call on the name of the Lord and to receive Jesus' gift of salvation from the cross for what he did for you. Now, if you have received Jesus, let me ask you another question as we wrap things up. Are you tuned in to the heart of the Lord at this time in your life? Or are you missing the moment? Are you missing this moment that God has for you here in March 2021? What's the Lord doing? Are you aware? Are you awake? Are you following him? Are you listening to him? Are you asking just for a temporary fix or are you allowing him to do a deeper work in you? Are you submitting to his plans? Are you seeking him with all your heart? Are we like the crowd demanding that Jesus just fix the, the current challenges? Or are we saying, Lord, what is the greater work you're doing? in me and, and through me right now? And then are we submitting and trusting that he is doing something much bigger than we can see with our eyes? Are we trusting that he is absolutely in control, that he holds the days, the seasons, the times, the hours and the minutes of our life in his hand? Are we submitting to him like that donkey did? Are we yielding our lives and getting on track with what he is doing? You know what? This has been a crazy season for all of us. COVID and the restrictions and all the constant changes, words can't describe how strange and tough this has all been. But let's hold fast to the truth that God is working everything out for our good and for his glory. Are you drawing near? Are you walking close? Are you tuning in to the heart of the Lord in these circumstances? Don't miss the moment. Don't miss what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Spend time with the Lord and gain his heart. Hear what he would say and how he would encourage you to keep pressing on, to not lose heart. We read that Luke 18 verse 1 in our men's prayer on Sunday. Jesus taught Men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And in that prayer time, as you spend time seeking him, ask God to comfort your heart and to reveal his heart in the moments that we go through every day in this trial and in this season because God is doing his work and nothing can stop him. And if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. So why don't we just join in and praise him? Why don't we get on board with him and worship him? Why don't we submit to him and say, Lord, use me for your sake and for your glory in this time. Identify if there is a distraction in your life, a sin that is weighing you down, you've got to pray about it. You've got to confess it. You've got to deal with it. Don't miss the moment. If there is a trial that is causing you to be anxious, bring it to the Lord be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He hasn't forgotten you. He's the God who sees. He's the God who knows what you are going through, and he is with you today. And he's working his greater good and he's working what is good for you because he loves you. His answers may be no. His answer may be not yet. He doesn't always say yes to what we want. But he's asking us 
to trust him. He's asking us to look for ways we can get on board with him today, that we can praise him today, that we can serve others today, that we can stop thinking about ourselves today, and that we can get on board with the Lord and his great plan. He's calling us to worship and to acknowledge him for who he is. So, Father, thank you so much. Lord, help us not to miss the moment, but really to draw near to you. You said in your word, those who draw near to God, you will draw near to them. You said that we can have access now to the throne of grace, that we can pray and not lose heart, that we can know you and know your heart, to know your voice in our daily life, that we can abide in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So I want to pray for our church family that you would comfort us, you would strengthen us, you would prepare us, you would build us up and fill us, Lord, with your Spirit. Lord, in every home that is watching, live or later, Lord, pour out your Spirit upon this body of Christ and upon all who are connecting with you in this moment. And Lord, help us to wake up. Help us not miss what you're doing. And in this Easter season, would you use us for your glory? Would you draw people to yourself? Lord, would you bring salvation to the hearts of many? And would you bring comfort and strength to us?